Welcome to the Startup Grind. For those of you first time here, it's really great to have you. Startup Grind is a global community of entrepreneurs. We host monthly events like this in over 160 cities in the world. over 160 cities in the world with the aim to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. So we bring in successful founders, the likes of Ken, and previously we posted uh, Uri Okolo, um, Eric Hassman, Kanye Tony. And the point is to bring entrepreneurs together in a space where we get to share the struggle, get to share the grind, get to learn from those who have gone before us and done it well. And we're also looking to create a platform for collaboration. Uh, we, we had an event centered around fashion last month. And last year, we hosted Muthoni Ndonga of Blankets and Wine. And the idea behind venturing into these new territories is to bring cohesion between techies and other people in the world. Uh, because techies tend to think they know everything and build solutions for those things that they think they know when really the actual problems remain unsolved. So I'm really glad you came. Um, the idea is to connect with someone, connect with people, not just to exchange business cards. The idea is that friendships grow from um, this place where we get to meet and learn. Uh, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors and partners, Google for Entrepreneurs, their uh, global partner of Startup Grind. I'd like to thank the iHub for letting us use their space, uh, and Buy More Card for being our access to students who are budding entrepreneurs. So I'm really excited to uh, introduce Ken today. Uh, Ken is a founder of Three Mice, uh, a company which he founded at 23, which began from um, the kitchen of an apartment somewhere next to Yaya, and grew into the largest web development company in Eastern Central Africa. After that, he went on to found Cellulant, which is a CEO, a company which is going into becoming a billion dollar company in the continent. Uh, so welcome, Ken. Round of applause. Uh, so I'm going to ask Ken a few questions for about 45 minutes, and then after that, we'll open it up to the rest of you. So it's really great to have you here, Ken. And thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for being too on time. <laughs> Um, so tell us, tell us about yourself. Uh, who are you? Where did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to school? And what is it that makes you an entrepreneur? Okay. I mean, in, interesting question. And I was listening to you introducing myself, and I'm like, okay, well, it sounds actually cooler than I than I remember it. I think it's when you're an entrepreneur, you remember the struggle, and uh, and the struggle actually starts from a long time ago. But uh, yeah, so glad to be here, uh, fellow entrepreneurs and uh, recovering employees, <laughs> and possibly some employees also. Uh, so I've been an entrepreneur for as far as I can remember um, by, by background. So I mean, if you listen to Timo and Ken and Kim, you kind of triangulate my age. So I've been uh, I've been around for a while. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm a father of three kids, uh, husband to one wife, uh, who's seated in the audience, who's also an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad when she was asked to talk, she didn't, uh, she didn't say anything, because that's not my recollection of her. <laughs> so yeah, so I went to school in Nakuru with, uh, with Kim. We were in high school, in a high school called Meninga. He was actually my desk mate. He was reminding me. Um, and he was tall. I always remember that there was a challenge fitting in, in, into the seat. Uh, so I was, uh, so I grew up in Akuru, born and bred in Akuru, came to Nairobi, went to uh, Strathmore just before, you know, we had, uh, back then I, I finished high school in 92, so in that, during that time we had two year lag before joining university. So, so I got a scholarship to go to Strathmore and I got into uh, computing almost by accident, I mean basically on the, on the, on the push of my single mother. And, uh, and I fell in love actually with uh, computers. I fell in love. Uh, then we become obviously became obsessive about programming and kind of just got sucked into that world. And then uh, two years later, then I went to University of Nairobi to study pharmacy. 
and uh, it was completely different uh, life. I mean, different environment. Uh, the teaching environment, teaching culture, very different. Strathmore is very orderly, very orderly institution, very inspiring lecturers. And I think University of Nairobi, the first culture shock was just getting into class and, uh, and, uh, and a lecturer walked in and never hardly spoke to us and, you know, was on the board. And I said, what, what is this? I mean, this is not what I particularly signed up for. But I also, the pharmacy was completely different from, from what I've, I'd grown to love and also what I thought it was going to be. You know, in high school when you select these programs, then you hardly know what they are about. So I was in pharmacy school for about one and a half years. So I failed my first year and repeated the class. So I thought that uh, I'd, I could try and make it work. I tried for another half semester. After half a semester, I said, well, you know what? The, I actually don't like this place. I don't like the lecturers. I don't like my classmates. Uh, and, and, and every time you know, a lecturer would be sitting, I'd be writing code on paper. So then computers were not as common as they are now. So I would write a software, debug it, I'd think up a project, write it, debug it, optimize the code, see whether I could fit it into half a page and whatever it is, things like that. So one day, I think for about a month or so, I didn't go to class. Uh, my mom, I hope you're not going to post this video on the internet. <laughs> my, my mom will kill me. And, uh, and for one month, uh, you know, I just never went to class and I was asleep most of the time, always in my room thinking. When I got out of that stupor, I clearly knew what I needed to do. And, um, and I, at that time, I was rem staying with my auntie. I walked uh, home, and we were just having a casual chat on the, over the kitchen. And I said to her, you know what? This pharmacy thing isn't quite working for me. Uh, and you know, she said, well, don't worry. Life's hard, this and the other, and whatever it is. Uh, if she was my mom, she would, she would have noticed, knowing my personality and my character, the gravity of that statement I made very casually. Um, and then the next day, uh, the next weekend, I just m moved with my stuff, my mattresses, blankets, whatever it is, and then, the, of course, the family went up in arms. <laughs> because uh, this uh, great dream of uh, this guy being Dr. Njoroga and this and the other was completely shattered. <laughs> and, I, and that's it, and so I, so I, I kind of knew that I wanted to go into computing. Um, and uh, by then, I'd started to kind of develop a little sort of interest towards internet. But I knew that I didn't want to be a pharmacist. And I, didn't, I knew that I didn't want to be a doctor. So I got off, uh, dropped out of school, uh, university, went back to Strathmore, uh, did another one year or so. But in the meantime, also got a job with one of the first ISPs. Uh, so I was an intern for about six months. Um, because I had so much interest in computers, in that short period of time, I hardly slept. And then I discovered this world of the internet where you could learn everything. You could, uh, I mean, there was this knowledge, world of knowledge. And um, my sort of focus around the internet was born. When I look at uh, basically those sort of that very defining moment in my life, I think that, uh, um, okay, so I was generally a rebel. I mean, I was, uh, I always disliked being told what to do. Um, I yeah, was very stubborn. My mom always says very stubborn. She still says I am. My wife still says I am. My colleagues still say I am. So I, so we, so I was a rebel, always wanting to sort of be a master of his own destiny. So when I took that decision to move out of uh, pharmacy school and uh, go back into computing and begin to look at this world of actually building uh, a business, being an entrepreneur, it was almost impossible to change my mind. Um, so I immersed myself, worked for six months, uh, moved uh, to another large ISP to help head a web development department. Uh, and one year uh, thereafter, I basically left to start my first entrepreneurial venture called Three Mice. Um, so, you know, so basically the that I always, when I look back, I almost feel that it was almost like a, you know, a, a car careening into a hill. You can't stop it. I mean, it's almost destiny just pushing me towards uh, being an entrepreneur. And then obviously then clarity becoming very clear what, which area, computing, internet, and within the internet, basically building uh, websites, e-commerce sites, et cetera. So that's what happened. 
so I did uh, three mice. Uh, so that was a very interesting journey. I mean, we started three mice without any money, started in a small kitchen. Uh, yeah, got a couple of, there was a couple of things were kind of instinctive. Um, at least I remember that time. Uh, one was always had some desire to build an institution. I mean, I was always, for some reason, uh, driven to kind of try and build some kind of world-class business. I think when I looked at my peers at that time, you know, because it was the early days of the internet, the Netscape and that sort of thing, they were always started by people that were my age and then within a short period of time then grew into billion dollar valuations, hundreds of millions of dollars and whatever it is. So that seemed to be the natural direction for a technology entrepreneur. So, so that kind of uh, formed a journey. And then in sometime in 2000, and, uh, 2000 actually, we, the business got acquired by Africa Online. Uh, and that also was a foundational moment in, uh, in my journey as an entrepreneur, in, uh, and both good or bad. Uh, the bad side, which is basically, you know, how do you structure those kinds of uh, uh, deals? We, we, didn't, we, we didn't know much at that time, so we didn't particularly structure a good deal. Uh, but good as well, because then we got into a larger group that, uh, you know, was run by a visionary CEO, uh, completely ambitious in terms of where he wanted to go. And you could see actually a, the making of a Pan-African business, and that was really nice. Um, and also, I think uh, the founder of Africa Online at the time uh, also took a liking for me, so he spent a lot of time with me a little bit. So I got uh, sort of my first early doses of mentoring in a tech environment. Um, but also Three Mice also taught me a couple of things. You know, what are the sort of first foundational things to do to actually position a business in the market? Uh, what things don't work? Which things look nice normally when you're on the outside? But once you get in, you find actually they don't actually make, make a difference. Um, yeah, so we did that, got very good market positioning, never made any money. So when people say that it was largest web development firm, I think it was the most known web development firm. I wouldn't call that then largest or successful, uh, not in the way that I define it this day. So it was a, a great business, great positioning, uh, nice cocktail speak, uh, but we worked hard, made very little money. And that was tough, and that in itself also carried a lesson. And then, uh, then um, uh, around 2002, 2003, uh, basically then, I started to look at uh, you know, opportunities. I always desired to sort of build a, a large business. And that time, we had uh, the two mobile operators as our customers. So then was Kencel and Safaricom. And uh, for me as a person, I had kind of migrated from being a programmer uh, to kind of sitting in between. Uh, so it, and this happened w one day just without ceremony. I you know, had been thinking in my mind around the fact that do I want to keep developing uh, forever do i want to sit behind this uh, sort of black screens do very clever things but you're the only guy that knows that they are really clever the mm -hmm. customer on the other side actually doesn't care uh cares for very simple things does it add value to my business does it work and then when it mostly does those things he actually forgets about you so it didn't seem like a nice place to be so one day i walked into uh, the office and i moved my desk upstairs to sit with the business development guys and then I changed my title. That's what, what, what happens when you, when, you, when you start your own business. You can do these things. <laughs> so, so I changed my title to something that I thought sounded nice, Solution Design Director. I saw it on your, on your profile, uh, on, on your description of me. And uh, ideally, that meant I sit, sat in between, went with the sales guys to the customers. And as they talked and whatever it is, I you know, started to obsess around these things that we build. Do they actually add value to the customer's business? Because I figured that if you couldn't answer that question, then the customer will always pay you what they want to pay you. And therefore, you could generally not grow. So in that journey of uh, living in that uh, thing, when we were working with a lot of these mobile operator customers, I started to really become immersed in their businesses. What drives their business? What makes this tick? And it was very easy to see the growth of mobile and whatever it is. And then one day it hit me that, shit, this thing called internet, actually maybe will make its way into the mass market in a form factor that's different from the way we see it. Because, you know, coming from the internet, you saw the internet in, t in a PC and a web browser, etc. And it occurred to me that, hang on, that actually, you know, when you break that apart, it's an application and a connected consumer 
and uh, some kind of int user interface, and that's what's happening in the mobile space. So my, my bug to go into the mobile space was actually formed during that time. And uh, so one day, you know, just like an entrepreneurs do, I walked into the office and I then, uh, there, but then we had a team of about 25 and I walked downstairs, I said, you and you come, walked upstairs, you and you come. I picked some of the best guys, went to a, a room and we created a little sort of skunk works uh, project. And uh, as we were bouncing around the afternoon, uh, when I looked at a lot of the web development firms that we used to benchmark around that time, for some reason, always had names that ended with A and T. It was Viant, Sapient, uh, whatever it is. And so, so there was this Cellulant thing. So we, I just wrote the name Cellulant, and it sounded, it rolled off the tongue nice. Wrote it on the wall, and we started to figure out. And I gave them a simple brief. I said, look, guys, there's something in this mobile thing. Let's figure it out. And then, um, so we had this sort of skunk work. We used to spend a couple of hours figuring out what we want to do with this mobile thing and whatever it is. And I tried to basically get this as a foundational agenda within, within uh, uh, three mice. Um, after some time, I think it became very clear that uh, we kind of all had very different visions of, uh, of the business uh, and very different uh, sort of goals in terms of scale. I was still very young, so uh, my, appetite for, my appetite for risk, my restlessness, uh, my tact in communication and whatever it is, you know, you put all that together. It's basically a chaotic uh, thing. Um, Paul. Uh, my partner was uh, a lot older, more sober, and at some time, you know, just this restlessness and just hunger to go out, uh, basically just began to demand that we need to put a little bit more of this thing that than was actually reasonable at the time. So the genesis of that is that then, you know, the partnership at some point just became not tenable. Um, uh, ultimately, then that path led us to actually doing a deal. So I, I owned half of three mice, and ultimately we said, well, you know, I will sign off my shares and I take off Skunk Works and uh, a couple of, uh, of of the good guys. I think Timo was one of them. And um, yeah, and Cellulant was born, and then and I sort of transitioned into Cellulant. Um, and uh, one of the contacts then that, uh, that I'd uh, made contact with was my uh, co-founder, uh, who became then my co-founder at Cellulant, was a Nigerian guy called Bolaji, who I met at uh, dinner uh, in accident. And that time, of course, when I had all these wild dreams of taking three mice across Africa, I'd, I'd uh, you know, looked at Bolaji and I thought that he could help us expand into Nigeria, because you know, if you're looking at Africa, you can't miss Nigeria. Um, and, and then, uh, and we said, well, Bolaji, you have two choices, you know, maybe, I, I, you know, do you want to continue with a web development dream or, do, do, you know, should we look at mobile? And he said, yeah, let's look at mobile. I think it's an interesting area. So we started Cellulant, uh, three mice, uh, Cellulant in a, with the Bolaji and a small uh, team. Uh, and uh, a couple of the foundational pieces of what Cellulant became, you know, it became set in stone. We wanted to still be a Pan-African business uh, we wanted to build a billion dollar business. Um, by that, then we hadn't defined it, whether is it revenue by value. I mean, we didn't understand those concepts at that time. Um, motivations might, might have been different. Maybe Bolaji, I suspect, wanted to be on the cover of Fortune. Uh, for me, I think it just looked like the thing that a successful technology entrepreneur does. Uh, but it was just, we looked at each other and we, without a sort of any written commitment, we knew that's what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, we knew that we wanted to be number one in kind of this mobile domain. At that time, we didn't know w w what kind of business model it was going to be. Uh, but we did sketch it on a Soviet. And what is very interesting is that uh, even today, uh, in sort of much more informed way, when I look at what the business model is, it's completely the same business model that we sketched on a Soviet. So then the language was maybe a little bit different. The understanding was a little bit different, but it's really the same thing. Uh, and we got in for for first two, three years. Uh, they were really basically survival years. Um, it was about uh, bracing what I call quite a number of near-death experiences. Um, the 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 uh, fin financing market was not there at that time. The nice pivot, uh, twenty thousand dollars, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars competitions were not not there. Uh, so we bootstrapped this thing first using Bolaji's credit card. 
And uh, later, if you ask, I'll tell you what happened to that credit card eventually. What uh, happened? So we stretched that card. <laughs> Uh, and then most systems are not online, no, uh, so so we got away with uh, with with with, with uh, actually being able to stretch credit on, on it. These days, I don't think that I think everybody's on, almost online. I, I, at least when I overdraw my card, I, it doesn't behave the same way that card used to behave. Uh, so we finance funded that first three years near death experiences, uh, dealing with the challenges of actually um, getting a startup to move to maturity without any money and stretching everything we could. And then, you know, we kind of got into the market, uh, stabilized the first set of services, which was a music service, new ringtone downloads, et cetera. And then after the first three years, I think the biggest uh, theme, at least that I can remember, was just, you know, applying myself to thinking about what kind of business do we need to be uh, to be a billion dollar business, what's a business model? And uh, somewhere that journey, into 2006, 2007, took us into the mobile banking area. And uh, that's a project that uh, Joel was alluding to. So, so Joel and I actually uh, worked on the mobile banking business model that uh, today powers Cellulans Engine. Um, so we, we, yeah, so, so, so that basically we looked at it and we figured that, yeah, I think at that time, we could see that we had a decent business and uh, which we could take across Africa. Um, but then mobile, operator, mobile operators took about 80% of revenues. Um, so, uh, you know, in typical cellular style at that time, we always say, well, we stop, everybody in the industry was just complaining and whining about how bad mobile operators are, bad safari is, and how unreasonable they are. Uh, at cellular, we kind of said, hey, hang on, this is an, if we could fix this problem, then we can build a decent business, or at least we can take a market position uh, that is better than most of the other guys. So, uh, so that uh, kind of uh, allowed us to define a um, payments problem in the market. And we said if we could, can fix it for music, not only will we fix, uh, build a good music business, uh, but we can take that capability and expose it to somebody else who has the same problem. So the sort of foundational uh, um, problem that forms our our current business, the payments business, was formed. So we did, and um, uh, we got into the market early. So for about uh, one year and uh, maybe two years, Joel, we knocked into the banks, and the banks would just look at us and say, I mean, what are you guys talking about? Who on earth would transfer money on their phones? Who will transact on their phones? And then M-Pesa hit the market. And uh, six months later, one year later, M-Pesa hit 1.2 million customers, and the banks went into panic. And uh, that r rushed them into our arms. Um, and that was a real sweet deal. <laughs> and, 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 um, and then we basically very quickly just built a foundational thing. And, and uh, I just remember that at that time I was like a madman obsessed. And I always told my team is acquire banks at all costs. Acquire at all costs. I intrinsically knew that it was going to be a problem. But I kind of figured out that, uh, well, you know, these guys, um, they are generally relatively stable. Um, so they don't change their minds very quickly. We acquire at all costs. At some point, we will stabilize the service. That's what we did. And within three years, I think we basically uh, locked about 14 of the banks that mattered in the country. And a couple of the multinationals took us into a couple of other markets. So we expanded very quickly our footprint into Western Africa, Ghana, into Southern Africa as well, um, and um, basically built a foundation of peace. So, uh, so as we did this, uh, of course, the business uh, did have different challenges. So moving from uh, a small team to a larger team across multiple markets, uh, changing business models and whatever it is was completely a nightmare in terms of uh, managing for, for, for me as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, but the business did grow, uh, and um, we basically financed a lot of the banking uh, growth out of debt. Um, and then, and then uh, as we began to mature the product and settle the mobile banking, then we began to under, uh, look at housekeeping, you know, how is the business structured, how is the balance sheet structured, how are the team structured. And that generally, more or less, has been, uh, I would say, to, is, to my today, is today my obsession. So 
One of the good things is the business has grown um, over the years. There's no question about it. Um, I, as a person, has also grown. Um, and those, and uh, third thing is I really enjoy the thing that I do. Um, I, you know, think what, what what is it that is uh, that sucks in that journey? Um, is that everything always took twice as long as you always thought it did? Uh, and that's why my friend Restless Joel is no longer there to enjoy the, 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 the actual realization of the nice business models we built on Excel. They really looked pretty on Excel until you look at them for year one and you realize actually the, the real world doesn't actually respect Excel. Excel is nice, you know, you change a figure and the numbers really look nice. In the real world, that journey takes a little bit harder. So the, everything took longer than it did. Uh, so you also put a little bit more time than, da, da, than, than it did. And if my wife was is gracious enough at later to make a comment, <laughs> she's a victim of that dynamic. Uh, you put more time, you know, that little sort of leave which you promise year after year just never actually comes. Um, because, you, you know, at every time you have a critical problem, if you don't solve it, then you have a problem. And then, you know, in technology, you put all your eggs in one basket, and it's a, it's a shifting ship, very high risk. Uh, technology changes, it's coming from all kinds of directions. That's why I'm here, because uh, you've got to figure out what's going on in the market, because the, our, our competitors are not the guys who operate and work like us. They're real competitors. We fear you know, these trends in technology, which you just never see, which I'm too old to see. So uh, the, the, the little programming I have, so I've stopped talking uh, tech. I've stopped pretending to be a technology guy to our engineers because the languages I used, uh, they're using different things, Ruby, I don't know, whatever it is. And, uh, I can't understand what those things are. So things change very quickly. Uh, making money, actually, is uh, for you as an entrepreneur, uh, hasn't happened yet 10 years later. Uh, so it's a good business, nice value on paper, but you know, for me as an entrepreneur, no, no money yet. So, so that is certainly a, a, a little bit of a surprise. Uh, you know, that's not, that wasn't quite overt as, an, as a, uh, nobody told me that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so that you discover over time. Uh, and that's it. So it's a, mark, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic journey. You learn a lot. It matures you as a person. Um, and uh, so yeah, and you learn a lot about business, about people, about the market, uh, about <laughs> your wife, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your friends. You know, it's really, it's really a nice life experience. Let me put it that way. As far as, you know, in the way that I've experienced, it's really a nice life experience. Uh, so when somebody always asks me, so Ken, don't you go on leave? I say, go or leave from what? <laughs> this is my life. I enjoy it. You know, because it's, it's really got all the elements of life, a little bit of soap opera, a little bit of sort of hard logical decisions. You made some things you don't understand, some learning to make. It's just a nice mixed spot. Uh, but yeah, but that's, um, that's my journey as an entrepreneur. All right. Uh, so one thing entrepreneurs always struggle with when you're starting out your business and as it grows and if it suddenly explodes is striking a balance. Uh, in the beginning, you will find yourself that you have to do everything that yeah. needs to get done. But at the same time, you need to not get so consumed that you lose track of the vision and stay on track with strategy. And then later on, that changes also into trying to balance work with relationships such as family. So for you, with your entrepreneurial ventures, with Cellulant and it having exploded, what have you learned about, about attaining such balance, productivity? Okay, so well, maybe, uh, I don't know whether I understand you correctly, but there's two themes there. So there's, um, so balance for you as an entrepreneur in terms of as the business demands more skill sets than you have. Yes. And then there's work-life balance, a little dimension of work life balance. Let me start with the easier one, which is work-life balance. I just haven't achieved it. So it's an, like an alcoholic, you know, so I go through mom moments of relapse. So I achieve work-life balance for like a week, then I relapse for three weeks. And then that's, so that is kind of generally not, uh, you just don't achieve it. So I tend to figure out, look, how, so how do you bring life into work? Uh, you know, because uh, the business just needs what it needs, and it's a, you know it's like a mission that consumes you. I mean, so I mean I'm really committed to building a billion-dollar business for whatever reason. I mean, it's just today if uh, 
if uh, my board of Bology came and told me, Ken, look, I'm actually not interested in building a billion dollar business, I'd say, well, then I'm the wrong CEO actually for this business because that's really what I'm obsessed about. So because of that obsession, you really, work-life balance is a struggle. I haven't mastered it. It's a, so what I do, I, I, if I can convince my wife, I bring her into this event. If I'm going for a dinner, I carry her. If I'm going to meet investors, I you know, adjust. And if, uh, and sooner or later, if they will allow me, I'll bring my kids to the board, board meeting, <laughs> right? So that you, is just a struggle. The sort of, the other thing, we, you know, how does the business, how do you balance then as a team requires more skill sets than you do? That's an easier thing. Uh, it's, well, at least a lesson is easy. It's not easy to do. And we talked about this uh, last time. So it, it's always about looking at, being comfortable with looking at yourself in the mirror. Um, and I always tell my team, so when you look at yourself in the mirror, you see two things. You see extraordinary talent and you see extraordinary shit. Um, and, you know, and you need to see both, right? And, and, and you can't afford to get caught up in one of them, right? So having understood yourself very well, then it's always saying, look, at every opportunity that you need, that you have, uh, recruit some, you need to spend less time on the things that you really suck at. You know? So for me, I must say that I really don't get goosebumps over looking at cash flow statements and whatever it is. But yet, a business of our size requires for you to have a very good grasp of those things. So what you do, you've got to go into the market and say, where can I find the hottest finance guy that there is, not that you can afford, that there is. And then you've got to convince them to come and work for the business. So, if, so you need to sell the spiel, you need to sell the dream, uh, and if at some point money is a determinant, you need to find it from wherever you can. Um, because every w time that you do not spend time on those things, the business suffers. But every time that you actually spend on that stuff that you're not good at, uh, the business also suffers. So you've got to do that. So I think um, I, our journey for progress, I would directly attribute it to having made those decisions uh, at the time we did. And we did that very, I did that very early on with our CTO, our current CTO, who's now a shareholder of the business. Um, and then, and then uh, we have a fantastic commercial head. So today our fantastic um, management team. Um, uh, some of them are homegrown, you know, so they grew up uh, in the struggle, in the, in the, in the resistance. Uh, and uh, and uh, our CFO is from Deloitte, so, so that basically so came in, but also accelerated into a CFO, so her age mates are certainly not CFOs of, of our size of business. So you ju it's all about people. Um, and I, I guess the, the other thing that I've learned about people is that you can never so you can never really be selfish as an entrepreneur with your dream, with, um, you've got to be generous to really keep great people uh, with you. you. It's not a, it's a team sport. I mean, building a good business, it's really a team sport. And uh, it's about basically recruiting an army of soulmates. They are not usually many. I think in my uh, sort of quick hypothesis around technology businesses, there'll be three or four. Uh, recruitment decisions are going to be ultimately critical as to whether you grow or not. So having understood yourself, then you, you ring fence yourself with superstars. So I was always, a, I started off a great programmer, uh, but you know, when I moved, made my switch from technology into the in-between, I stopped being a great programmer. So I needed to cover that gap very well because at a technology, in a technology business, you really need superstar engineering team. Uh, and that I that that's certainly one of the most foundational decisions I made, um, and you have to share the dream. So you know, so our CTO is a significant shareholder of the business, uh, and he bared his soul. To, he invested. He didn't put any money, but he invested his soul and his energy to to build the business. And I then uh, later, you cannot put a financial value to that. Uh, goal. So it's always about giving. So Bolaji and I started the business. We owned the business 50-50. Uh, we got our C CTO in. Uh, then we got our chairman in also, uh, very important, uh, to bring governance, basically to bring adult supervision 
as I called it at that time, one of the smartest decisions we made. We also gave a little bit of our, of our equity to make that happen. Uh, so today we basically, so Bola, Bolaji and myself maybe just own just a little uh, under half the company. So we have given up the other for very specific critical people that came at critical times. And of course investors also who also brought a lot of value. So it's always about giving. Uh, but it's team. It's a team sport. And you look at the team from the board, you look at the team from the management team, and you look also at the team uh, that gets the work done every day. So once, once you have this great talent on board, beyond shareholding and beyond large salaries, how do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them believing in the cause? Well, I mean, am I a great motivator? Maybe Timo and uh, Joel have a different view. I mean, uh, they, 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 they most probably be the guys. They are good guys, so they left. So that means that uh, maybe I'm not that great a guy um, <laughs> around motivating people. But let me tell you, why did the ones that stay, stay? And why did the ones that go, go? What did I learn from those two experiences? So um, I think the, the ones that said, why did they stay? I, I mean, I, why, why, why are those guys with me? I don't know, actually. It's a good question. Uh, I'd like to believe that I'm generally sharing. I mean, I really want them to do well, uh, not just as employees, but as people. Um, why did the ones that uh, that uh, left left? I think is uh, so. I'm a little bit pushy. I'm very fairly stubborn, and I'm set in my ways. So when I focus my mind on a mission, I take few prisoners, and I don't take no for an answer. So in that sense, I can be a real pain in the ass. So, but in terms of managing people, and you see a little blend of both. Um, but what I've come to realize that look. Just be who you are. Uh, ultimately, leaders attract their followers, right? Um, yeah, the, the leaders attract their followers. So my current guys, I'm still the same stubborn, pain the ass guy. But you know, maybe Faisal knows well. I need to when I if I want to engage, can I just show up at his house on a Saturday morning? He's a bit more relaxed. He's less uptight, uh, and I'm seeing it on my own terms, so I can get things done. So they learn you. They know how to get things done. Uh, sometimes also, they, you know, you build such sufficient trust and they can just look at you and say, Ken, I mean, just listen. <laughs> and it works. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take you back to the beginning of Three Mice. Uh, this was in the 90s. Uh, so what was it like building a business in that environment? Uh, what kind of resources did you have at your disposal? Was it easier or harder compared to building a business now? Gosh, I'm not sure I can answer that question because um, you see the context is different, very different. Um, I, I haven't actually, to be quite honest, started the business now. And uh, you know, I've been at it for a long time. You have contacts, you know what needs to be done and whatever it is. So, it can't, so I can't make a reasonable comp comparison. But I can paint a sort of uh, big picture of, of what, uh, what was happening then. So then there were no venture capitalists. We were in a sense, the early pioneers of the first sort of internet uh, and IT companies. So, so we built everything from scratch. You figured out uh, everything by yourself and that sort of thing. And uh, you socialized the talent for that business in that way. Um, but also, there was no competition. Um, so, so what you know, the environment lacked in terms of the support ecosystem, it also compensated for the fact that there was no competition. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, 23-year-old starting a web development firm. I mean, you had all the right ingredients. You know, naivet. Uh, you think that you're going to make tons of. Uh, uh, you're going to build a business in terms of scale, and uh, money within a re relatively short period of time, and whatever it is. So there's nothing around your environment to dispel your myths. Uh, so you kind of hop on and start it with all sort of. Uh, <laughs> all the ignorance in the world, which is very important, by the way, uh, very early in the, in the business, I think. Um, uh, I think now when I look at the market, I see there's lots of uh, venture capital. There are places like I have. There are startup grinds, forums, and, start, and, and sort of thing, that sort of thing. I don't know whether it's the foundational principles of starting a business, whether it is actually easy. I think it just is difficult. 
Um, you have to get the foundations right. You have to have a lot of luck. Um, you have to be very disciplined. Uh, the principles of business don't bend because you have a internet business. I think that's one of the myths that um, technology companies have seen over time tend to have. You think that uh, the foundational rules of business somewhat change because you're in an innovation in an innovative place or you're building an innovative product. I think those fundamentals are in place. You really need to understand your market. Uh, you need to have started your business with the right reasons, uh, for the right reasons. And making money is not uh, exa actually a great reason to start a business because um, it's going to take a while. And uh, if that then is an obsession, then you make foundational uh, decisions which are fatal. Um, yeah, but I would think that the foundations are the same. The environment might be different. There's more competition, whatever it is. Starting a business is just starting a business. Would I want to start a business? No. I wouldn't do it. Uh, I've done it once, twice now. I wouldn't do it a third time. Actually, if, I, if, if uh, basically I extracted the path which I had and I modeled that as a business case and, say, and then it looked like, okay, well, this is a journey you're going to go. These are the risks you're going to take. This is how long it will take to actually grow and to get where it is. It would be such a stupid thing to do. Um, I wouldn't just do it. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's my own perspective. OK, well, yeah. thanks for that. I shudder, actually, everybody. When somebody comes and says, I want to quit my job, I want to start a business, I just shudder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what I normally say, so uh, some time back I, w I would spend time asking them about their business model and whatever it is and things like that. These days I ask them, have you spoken to your wife? Uh, so why don't you do this? Why don't your wife and, my, and, uh, and you come ho home for dinner? And my wife and I will talk to you. And then, you know, then, then I'm interested in, so because it's, it's a journey. So it's a selfish thing. As an entrepreneur, you start a business because you have a burning desire. But the guys actually who bear the brunt of that decision, they're always the guys around you, <laughs> your family and whatever it is. But I guess it takes the courage to actually step out. You have to go through the bad before it actually gets less bad. I wouldn't call it courage. I think it's <laughs> naivete. It takes naivete to start a business. It takes a, took naivete certainly to start three mice uh, at a time. It also took naivete to start uh, Cellulant with a billion dollar vision and three thousand dollars in our pockets, right? Not courage. I wouldn't say that we were just courageous. We were just outright dumb, outright naive. Because the business models we were doing is that you say, well, Safaricom has five million customers. We are going to start this service, you know, ten percent of them are gonna use it per month and whatever it is. And and guess what? You know, you switch on those services day one and then you realize that actually consumers had a life of their own. So it's not like there were, these guys, you know, always this is, they were not sitting around looking at the phone and saying, when is this cellular going to come on? <laughs> and then when it comes on, they start clicking away. And, you know, so the sp Excel spreadsheet uh, that we did, and even the one that we did, Joel, at the time when we were even sufficiently wiser, always kind of sees the world that way. And then you switch on that stuff. And, man, you know, the guys, they have got children. They are taking guys in school somehow. You know, clicking at your service was not uh, sort of a thing that I wanted to do. So it takes naivete, courage. Uh, I mean, I'd like to know whether there's an entrepreneur here who started a business on courage. Make guys in the army, then those <laughs> guys and do courage in business. Let's agree that we are just plain naive or we are cushioned by some capital somewhere. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's my thoughts. Okay, so tell us about the Three Mice acquisition by Africa Online. How did, how did that conversation begin? And were you happy with the end result? Is there anything you've learned now about dealing with investors that you wish you could have applied then? Yeah, I think, um, um, yeah, so that was an interesting thing. Um, so what ideally we ended up doing, and I don't know whether this is right to say in a public forum, but what we ended up doing is um, we got a loan. And then, so, so I give you, so essentially the deal was like, so I give you a loan, I take, uh, I own 95% shares of the company, 
And if you're a good boy and you grow on a certain trajectory, I give you back 25% uh, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, so that, in, in the end, was how the deal ended up. How it started, of course, was completely different. So what did I learn from that thing? Uh, one is that uh, this thing called, these guys called lawyers, uh, uh, they are good ones are extremely expensive, bad ones are super expensive. <laughs> um, so, you know, so today when I walk into a transaction, I look at the specialization of that transaction, and I say, who is the best lawyer in, in the world that I know that is a master in this space? So, so that's, that's how I start. I'd rather than, than say, I, let me go and fight with that guy about fees. But I am not confused about getting the best that there is. Secondly, is that actually, the, the, once you take out a language, the foundational principles, you really just got to understand them. So, so I don't sit and assume that, well, this is, uh, these are lawyers that are talking, they're talking legal speak. I like to understand the principles. And i just not afraid to ask and say, well, so what the bloody hell does that clause mean? And why is it like that? Why can't you simplify it? You know? so, I, so I'm a pain in the ass also for lawyers. And I say, well, why is it that, why do you write documents only the two of you can understand? Uh, and yet, it is me and this other guy that want to do this thing that you guys are talking about, you know? Uh, so, so understanding just the stuff, asking questions, and um, following the principles, and uh, not being afraid to seek um, advice when you need to. So also when you get into a transaction, say, who else has been in a transaction of a similar nature? Who has done it well? Who has done it badly? And you go and you say, well, and of, oftentimes, as long as you're willing to share, uh, because that's always a problem. You tend to think, that, well, I'm getting a little, little good deal. I want to keep it sort of confidential and whatever it is. I just go and say, hey, guys, I've got this uh, transaction. This is what the structure looks like. You guys have done this before. And I'm always amazed that people are always willing to share. And they say, well, we did a transaction like that. We structured it that way. We lost this much money. Uh, and this is what we got wrong. And so, so, uh, so my attitude towards legal transactions is always fully engaged. Uh, and if for some reason I cannot have the time to be fully engaged, then it's not the right time. Um, and the third big profound lesson is that um, you, you should always walk into a deal uh, uh, knowing very well that you should be prepared to walk out at any one point. You should draw, draw a red line. When you walk into a deal, you say, well, when I, and, and you know, you should do that in front of, before the deal, so that you are not under duress. And you say that actually, the rationale of this deal makes sense up to here. Beyond here, the deal doesn't make sense. You should make that decision before you walk in. And, um, and when the red line is crossed, just walk out. Because you remember, you drew the red line without duress. You are in your sane mind. You are not influenced by how long you guys have been doing it. Uh, like in the three months, uh, days at that time, it was a very tough time in the company and uh, we needed to grow. I could see the market wanted our services. And then, so you are in this transaction and then you have actually spent, you have actually invested this money before you ever got the check. You now see I'm going to buy the servers, uh, that talented uh, programmer which I met and whatever. And those things cloud your judgment in signing the deal. Even when there was a flag around uh, foundational terms changing during the process, it just doesn't flag. So draw the red line before the deal. And throughout the deal, if the red line gets crossed, just say, thank you very much, gentlemen. I think we've spent six months of a great, great meeting you and walk out. It's always, you're always going to be better off. So those are my sort of lessons uh, out of the deal itself. Okay. Uh, so with, with Cellulant, uh, you've, you've grown to many different African countries. So what was, what was the expansion plan there? How did you decide this is where we're going next and this is the product we'll have for this country? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really evolve that way, to be quite honest. Um, I mean, we, we started off with a very strong foundation that we wanted to be across Africa. So that was a desire. So there was a strong 
foundational pillar that we wanted to be across Africa. So when opportunities for us to be in a country did pop up, we took them. So when we went into banking, uh, a couple of the early multinational banks uh, took us to Zambia, took us to Botswana, took us to, uh, to Ghana, and we did. And, um, and you know, at a phase of the business, uh, you know, so we were obviously a business that had been there for a while. But in the mobile commerce space, which was more or less a business of the future, uh, so first, you couldn't tell which direction it was going to go. But instinctively, you knew that you, know, you needed that you know, if you had a banking piece, that you know, you'd have a critical piece. And you'd, you kind of instinctively knew it was difficult for somebody else to get it. Uh, so when the bank said, well, we want to launch in Ghana, we did. Uh, did we sit and do a biz big business plan as to whether we should be in Ghana? Not really. Um, um, did we f see barriers of, oh, I need to know a Ghanaian? Not really. I mean, uh, um, or, uh, oftentimes at that time, we said, Lulu, can we afford a ticket? Can we afford uh, to book the hotel? Yes, I did. And I showed up in one, actually, one of the markets like Botswana. Uh, for some reason, uh, we couldn't get telephone connections into those. So we could never book, uh, book a meeting with operators. So I hopped onto a plane because we had a very aggressive launch timeline. And I showed up, uh, came from the airport, went to the hotel, dropped my bags, uh, hopped onto a taxi and said, to take me to the mobile operator. There were two large mobile operators, went to one headquarters, showed up at the reception and said, well, I'm from, from Nairobi, we can't get through to you. Um, I'd like to see your chief commercial officer. And, uh, and I understand it's an unscheduled appointment, so if he doesn't have time, that's fine, but at least we can make an appointment. Uh, and you know, uh, one thing about doing business in Africa is that we are generally a hospitable lot. And uh, what I'd find of oftentimes is you're from Nairobi, you're a foreigner uh, from another African country, it was always very welcoming. So the guy said, oh my God, you've come all the way, whatever it is, so come, let's meet. And sometimes I'd walk out of a meeting with an NDA, I'd walk out of a meeting with APIs, and whatever it is, and that's actually how we did our regional expansion. So. Uh, of course, we did uh, with Joel some did some modeling about what the you know the opportunity was. But once the, we ex left the Excel, uh, we just went out and just went and got things done. Of course, as the business then becomes, you have more people and whatever it is and things like that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, doing that doesn't happen because also a lot of the guys also uh, that um, join the team much much later. Uh, 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 you don't have the same wiring, don't have the same understanding, don't have the same uh, kind of uh, uh, decision sort of gusto. Uh, so you've got to be organized a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, but that's, how, that's what it was for, for us. So, so today we've, we've, so we've been in 10 countries. So uh, this year we'll go into another two or three. Yeah, that process, when I watch the team that's going into those countries, it's a little bit different process from the way we went into those markets. I can understand why they need to be planned, they need to be disciplined. Uh, maybe going into the next 10, because we want to be in 23, yeah, that certainly is a very disciplined process. We are figuring out, we know which markets represent greatest potential and whatever it is. But I, in the early days, that was just academic. I mean, so, so I do a business plan for Ghana, then it tells me that I need $200,000 to get in. Uh, then I don't have it. Then it becomes the business plan is a nice discipline thing, but becomes a barrier. So it's just easier to just hop on and say, well, to get into Ghana, to set up meetings, to get APIs, to get connectivity into mobile operators, it's going to cost me $20,000. And uh, what I need to do is first get myself there. And then that's $3,000, that's a small problem to solve. Uh, so that's kind of how we've sort of built a business over time. What advice would you give to startups with the potential to scale to other African countries uh, in terms of when to do it, uh, at what point in the business they should do it? Yeah. Uh, do you think there's something like scaling too fast? Um, OK, in terms of expanding across Africa, my gut sense is so what I see is so Kenya is a terribly competitive market. So I always. Uh, always tell people that, okay, so Kenya will hone your discipline as a business because they, every man, his brother, and his wife have a business similar to yours. 
um, and you really have to be sort of on top of things to really take a market position. So what I've seen is that uh, so the mar Kenyan market does discipline you a lot. And then when you take that discipline outside of the borders, then you really tend to find little resistance. So, uh, so I tend to think that yeah, you, hon you will hone your management talent and your competitive DNA in Kenya. If you can build structure into it, then certainly you will cross over and you will take over Uganda. Tanzania will be a little bit of a challenge, but there will be opportunities there. Uh, certainly you will have opportunities, at least in technology, you will have opportunities in the Southern Africa region. Nigeria, my God, they really love Kenyans. We are, we are, they are smarter than we are, uh, but we are more disciplined than they are. Um, and, and they appreciate that discipline. Uh, so the businesses at a certain scale, when they want to work with partners or providers who have some level of structure and some level of discipline, uh, and an exotic kind of business, Kenyan, Kenyan business will do well if you can master um, that thing. I think in most markets, the foundations of African markets are more or less the same. You know, the problems, the structures of the markets are more or less the same. But the nuances of markets are very different. In Nigeria, the nuance of how they do business, how they make decisions is very different from Kenya, uh, Southern Africa as well. So if you go through that short period where you understand the nuance of the market, then uh, it is possible to actually build uh, quite a decent business across markets in, um, in, um, in, 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 uh, in Africa. So, so Kenya will certainly always continues to be a large market for us, at least by revenue. Uh, but by profitability, a lot of our other markets are more profitable than Kenya because, you know, you know so in Kenya, every pound of punch you put, you get two pounds of two dollars. Uh, in other markets, you put a pound, pound of punch, you get five dollars back uh, because the market is uh, less competitive. Uh, at least in the mobile payment space, we are three years ahead of most markets, so everybody la wants to pick the learnings from you and whatever it is and things like that. So there's a lot of opportunity for businesses across Africa. You have to do it at the right time. I think, um, yeah, there is such a thing as basically indisciplined expansion. Um, so you need to make sure the foundations are, uh, are sound uh, before you begin expanding. Otherwise, you spread yourself too thin. Uh, I think we started expanding uh, a little earlier than we were ready. Uh, but that context we only survived because we were very mobile space, the mobile uh, payment space, Kenya was generally ahead. So we actually had the time to learn. But if we try to do that now, the market would punish us severely. So just, so expanding at the right time is very important. What would you say is the opportunity for Cellulant in the market now? What should startups in the mobile commerce space focus their efforts on uh, someone who you could potentially acquire? Yeah. Well, the mo mobile commerce space is a big space. Um, we, I mean, in terms of market size, I mean, in terms of figures, we size it at maybe about $25 billion. The, and mobile commerce means everything from uh, M-Pesa to mobile banking and everything in between mobile payments, et cetera. In, uh, the, top 23 markets that, um, that uh, ho have 80, 90% of Africa's mobile customers. Uh, so it's a huge space. We are on ground zero. I mean, the uh, M-Pesa is by far the largest success. I mean, you look at their numbers, their revenues are maybe 25 or so billion shillings. So if you look at that market opportunity, there's a huge market opportunity. Uh, it's obviously getting competitive. It's terribly fragmented. So. So for us, for instance, we are fighting multiple battles in multiple battlefields, which is generally not a great dynamic because you're fighting small, specialized local competitors in different markets. The market uh, structures are very different. In Kenya, for instance, M-Pesa ships the market because they've got a market leadership position. In Nigeria, there is no M-Pesa, and the regulatory framework does not allow a mobile operator to pay M-Pesa, so there's a huge opportunity. There is a Southern African market where uh, they are evolving along the lines of Kenya, but the dynamics, the, mo the mobile money operators are not as big as m -Pesa is. So very fragmented, huge opportunity, very fragmented. Uh, it's a bloodbath. I mean, it's very competitive. Uh, and we'll continue to get so because more people are jumping at it. Uh, 
mobile operators I need small startups uh, driving different things the cellulans who have been there for a little longer also there uh, so it's very competitive um, but but there's a lot of headroom for growth okay so just before I open it up to the audience given all that you've learned uh, in your as, as an entrepreneur in in what ways would you like to give back to the community uh, for example do you mentor startups or what would someone potentially get in touch with you for? Okay. Well, I'm, to be quite honest, I dislike this thing of give back. I mean, what do I have? Um, um, Knowledge? Um, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't understand it. But, I mean, in terms of, I mean, so I'm deeply passionate about entrepreneurship as a theme. And I've, uh, I'm, uh, I deeply believe that uh, you know entrepreneurship has the f it's basically the engine for job creation in you know Africa's exp expanding economies, uh, and I've experienced deeply the problems of uh, that can kill small businesses. I mean we we've gone through uh, quite a number of near death experiences in our early years, and they are really fatal. So when you look at obviously uh, the st survival rate of small businesses, I you know extrapolate that statistics and I say well. Actually, some of these businesses had no business dying. I mean, they, maybe the entrepreneurs, the businesses had the right foundations, but they just never survived because the environment was a little bit uh, tough. Um, so I'm deeply passionate about certain things. I'm passionate about the angel, the lack of angel investors um, at very vulnerable two-year, three-year stage uh, because I've experienced that problem a few times in three months' journey and a few times. Actually, if we had an angel investor, we would never have made the decision we did at Africa Online. And that decision itself was fatal because it altered the foundations of the business structurally. That in the end, that I, w I could say that, yeah, so a lack of an angel investor almost killed that business because then we got into a bad deal, which then changed the dynamics of the partnership completely. Uh, and at Cellular, of course, we went through lots of near-death experiences. Um, um, so I'm passionate about that. Um, um, so, and I would like to, add, uh, you know, once I retire from Cellulant, um, um I would like to really uh, immerse myself in, in trying to address that challenge. You know, and as entrepreneurs, you are always obsessive about problems. We're obsessive about the payments problem, that's why, you know, we are in Cellulant. Right? But I'm also obsessive about the fact that there are just no angel investors. And an angel investors, in my books, they are just angels. That's what they do. You hang out. Of the afternoon, they look into your eyes, they listen to your stuff, uh, and at the end of that thing, they write you a check. Uh, and no, no long stories about I don't know what ratchet is in the other. All these stupid things that uh, that uh, those that are not angels don't do. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Ken. So we'll take a few questions from the audience. Hi, Ken. So um, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, just two questions from me. You, I've been reading this book, uh, The Hard Things About Hard Things. And I want to hear uh, more about, uh, you spoke about some near-death experiences. Uh, just tell it like it is on some of the uh, sort of like the scenarios that you felt were near-death experiences. Because I think those really helped to shape guys and to realize that however bad it gets, uh, you just need to wake up the next day and just uh, move forward. That's one. And then the second one is about, you spoke about luck. Uh, if you are to speak about the role you feel luck has played uh, in Cellulant or in your journey as an entrepreneur, yeah. uh, what would you say about that? Thank you. OK. Uh, yeah, I think those are good questions. Um, so near-death experiences, there are many. Uh, but uh, but uh, in uh, Cellulant's journey, they always had something to do with uh, uh, financing gap and that's why I'm generally passionate about this angel thing and ideally what they were always about I think in uh, Cellulant uh, we went through a couple I think one memorable one which has shaped me a lot of my uh, thoughts about what I'm going to go do next at, at, uh, in the future 
this issue of angel. And I remember what happened. So you get into the market um, and, you know, you've got this business, nice business model that, you know, 10% of Safaricom's customers will use my services. That's 2 million guys at 50 shillings and whatever it is. And then you get in and that's not what it is. Um, and, but then, you know, you've taken servers on credit, uh, you've expanded capacity, people hired, whatever it is and things like that. And then it doesn't pan out for one reason or another. Um, so we went through this period, I think it was, must have been in 2005. And uh, so then we had got pa gotten past the hard time, so we'd gotten a service in the market. And uh, we had gone through, we had uh, actually, by this time already clear that, yeah, we could see how the revenues were kind of evolving, but we had a serious cash flow problem because mobile operators paid in 90 days. Um, and then we were early in the market, so the processes to actually make that 90 days happen were just not there. So uh, it could take 90 days, sometimes one 20 days, and sometimes even longer. And then, so you've got this scenario where salaries not paid, rent in the office not paid, rent at home is not paid. And my wife, I apologize for repeating this again, these are, these are painful experiences. Um, and uh, your team salary is not paid for three months, four months. And everything is hanging on such a balance that any little thing can actually kill the business. So today, at that time, if your head of technology walked out, you're almost uh, dead because, you know, you know, you need to unjam this thing. I mean, you need to keep services going, you need to keep the things running. So that's really a stuck near-death experience. Your rent at home is not paid. Uh, your water's running out. So basically, there's nowhere to hide. Um, so that's a near that experience. So, you know, how do you cope with that, I think? I really don't know. My, uh, my, my partner, Bology, is deeply believes that there's a loose nut in my head. That's, that's what it does. Uh, so I think, I, you know, I, I can't explain, but you just you go home, you sleep and then in the morning you gotta wake up and go and face the beast. And you have to go out and just systematically break down the problems. Yeah. And and then and in that process you you you'll be amazed at you know what you really generally what actually happens is you turn everything upside down. And when you sit at home and you're sitting as you're staying staring at that TV, as you're thinking about that problem, after one hour of staring at that TV, then you actually look at come on, this thing, how much of how much time do I actually spend time watching this thing? Can I sell it? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do I really spend looking at this thing? Um, so it's it always just up to go. You have a good night rest, and you come back and you just try and address a problem. So during this one of these near-death experiences, and uh, and then you try to figure out, you want to figure out, okay, so where are you going to get? Because then it's not revenue is not my problem. It's cash. You know, this dips. And then luck, you know, always as, as it always happens. I remember, so your bank will give you any credit, you've sold everything you can, uh, you borrow from every friend you can, basically you're completely dry. So one of these fine days, you know, I got a call and that's from one of my suppliers. So uh, as a young business, never hide from your suppliers when they call you. That's the moral of the story. So I pick up this call and of course I'm generally now bracing myself for a conversation because then you have paid this guy for six months. And then this guy says, Ken, so I know you haven't paid me for a long time, but can we have lunch? Okay, so I say, well, I mean, I'm not looking forward to that lunch, but <laughs> <laughs> I want to go. And so during this period, we were trying to um, find, so I have this graph, you know, so we have revenues, then there's nothing. Because at the times that there's nothing, nothing is working. Your links have been cut off unless you can't actually generate revenue. Then, then that again, then like that. Team moment. Why do then? Was that the stress that you felt? <laughs> so, uh, so this supplier was a guy where we basically had a structure where they provided us music on on a revenue share basis. So every every song we sold, uh, we paid them I think about two shillings. So, and during that time, I was trying to find money. And, uh, and typically, for some, for some reason, I always imagine that guys uh, who typically had money had cufflinks and things like that. Uh, so I'd seen a couple of those guys, and the, the last one I remember seeing, 
you know, I'd, you know, he asked me for a business plan, so I go and, uh, you know, put my mind to putting one together and sit and whatever. It, and I remember the last meeting which I had with him, which was a week before this lunch. And the, so the guy looks at this thing and says, Ken, your debt to equity ratio is all off. And I looked at him and I said, so what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I, all I know is that if I don't raise two million bob, this, I can't get rid of this trough. So what all this debt to equity ratio me means? So now I've got a swanky finance guy, so I, I know what it means. But that, so, so this guy looks at it, and interestingly, he pulls from his jacket a piece of paper, and he had drawn the same graph. So he says, Ken, you don't usually pay me, but just let's set that aside. He says, so sometimes I raise good invoices, and, you know, and he had plotted the month. So he said, what happens here? And what happens in these days? So he listened. Then he, he said something very surprising to me. So he said, Ken, so if I give you a million, what are you going to do for me? And completely took me off by surprise. But I'm a quick thinker, so I told him, I'll give you another extra shilling for every ringtone you sell. Then, of course, I knew that equity has a value. You don't give it away just like that. So he says, oh, fine, let me go and think about it. He calls me the next day. And then, he, so he's come with another guy. Not these guys don't wear cufflinks. And I have nothing against cufflinks. <laughs> so this guy says, so well, that story that you gave me yesterday, could you tell it to this guy? And I explain to this guy, and then this guy grills me. Uh, and then he says, no, actually what you need is not one million, you need about three million bob. Have you paid your taxes? No. So I need, you need to pay them. And then I say, so do you have an agreement? And then I'm in shock. I say, well, I can put something together. And I, that night I go and put something together. And they say, we meet at the bank. And then I send them an agreement. They don't even sign it. They, we meet at the bank and they wire me the money. And I have my angels in that, in that thing. And then so one guy I've given two, an extra one shilling, another guy an extra one shilling and 50 cents because he gave me two million bob. So that's the thing. So near-death experiences are actually just near death. At that time, anything can go wrong. Your wife can leave you. Your landlord can throw you out. Uh, you can go crazy, your tech can leave you. I mean, it's near death. Any one of those things will completely change the balance and kill the business. So that is a very defining moment in terms of luck. Uh, very defining moment in terms of a near death experience. So vivid in my mind. Also, it shaped a lot of... So those guys were actually angels. Uh, they don't possibly see them themselves as such, but that's really what they were, they were angels. And interesting, they came from different, they were actually suppliers to the business, uh, as opposed to investors, very interesting. And you always say, uh, and throughout my life, and so luck and whatever it is, you tend to find angels everywhere, in the customers. Uh, at the time we signed up the first multinational bank, uh, we, uh, we ran into an Indian guy, and. Uh, you know, we, we kind of pitched this idea, uh, and Joel is smiling, you'll remember this. And this guy looked at me and looked at my CTO and say, I mean, I don't know you guys very well, but I get a sense that you know what you're talking about. So here's what we're going to do. My pay grade allows me to sign $10,000. If, if it's above $10,000, I have to justify to 20 people all over my ass who have never been to Africa. That was his language. So he says, so you guys, I know you're a small company, you need to make money, but go and decide whether you want to do this. If you do this, we, it's going to be a hell of a fight, but you do your bit, I'll do my bit. And, uh, and, and if you do a good job here, I take you to Africa. And we looked at this, him in the eye, we took the call, and he took us to Africa like he did, and we did our bit. Uh, and almost actually, our top five customers, typically that is kind of similar story. Um, so yeah, so lots of luck as well. So do you go to church, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you look familiar. Okay. So we're almost running out of time. We'll take one more question. Okay, two more questions. So I'm lucky. I have the microphone. I get to go by default. Uh, hi, Ken. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I have two questions, actually, but the first one is really brief. I know you mentioned uh, how ignorance played a part in you becoming a success. Um, keen to know, you know, how did you choose your first product, uh, ringtones? Uh, how did you come about uh, ringtones and decide this is what we're going to go with? And the second question is, 
You talked about uh, basic principles and foundations of a business, uh, whether it's a tech business or any other business. And you know, from in your opinion, what are those key principles that a business needs to you know stick to? Okay, so so let me qualify this ignorance. So ignorance about what it takes, not ignorance about the market. That is completely unforgivable in my books. Um, so when I went into when we chose the ringtone business, we really had read everything we could on that business. So we really understood the business very well. Um, so there's no, no excuse about getting into a market and being ignorant about the market. You can be, we were ignorant about what it took, you know, what was the journey going to be like. But we're never ignorant, never been ignorant about the market. Uh, and the second question is uh, sort of key principles. I, I mean, there are many, but you know, so some remarkable things, I think, uh, which were sort of pertinent in our journey was deciding very early where you want to go. So for us, when we made a decision that we wanted to be a billion dollar business and nothing less, it shaped every decision we made. The way you looked at talent, the way you identified market segments, everything. And because we knew that that was not, it wasn't a convenient goal, it was just an unshakable goal of what success meant. Um, you know, so when I looked at a decision, I said, which is the, wh which is the decision that billion dollar businesses make? Uh, and it was never, some, some of them were never convenient in the short term, but I had a guiding light. So that clarity is very important, I think, Ali. It sh sorts out a lot of, a lot of um, uh, sort of you know, fluff in trying to make decisions around things. Um, the other one, I think, is um, deciding, you know, what kind of business do you want to be? Um, uh, so in my sort of simplistic view, I see two types of businesses. What, a, what I call lifestyle businesses, and then there is basically sort of enterprise, I would call them. So lifestyle businesses is essentially the type of business where uh, you, know, you run a business, you make 30 million bob at the end of the year, uh, your costs are 20 million, then you take 10 million bob and you share it with your partner. That's a lifestyle business. And there's no right or wrong, it's just a choice. Uh, entrepreneurship uh, enter enterprises are the kind of business where you make 30 million bob, uh, you take uh, t 10 million bob and you go into a new country or start a new market and whatever it is and take nothing back. You don't go and buy yourself a mortgage. So you got to choose which kind of business you are, you, you do because those dis businesses determine you will make very different decisions and, and ideally should have very different expectations of those business. Um, so I don't understand the lifestyle business, um, but I understand the enterprise business. What I know is once you take that path, then you've got to be comfortable with a couple of things. One is that uh, you as a founder are not going to see money anytime soon because your natural wiring is always to invest. Um, and I remember somebody, you know, one day asked me, so, so how many guys are you in the business? So today we are 230 and they're like, what? Why do you need 230 people? I said, I don't need, half of them I don't need for today. Half of them are for tomorrow. Uh, what that means, it means that uh, Bolaji and I and Faisal and everybody are generally underpaid uh, and it's just our DNA. There'll be people in the business today who earn more salary than I do, than Faisal do. That's just the nature of things. You need to get their skill set and that thing. So when you choose an enterprise, you will always make those kinds of decisions. And they're not convenient for, for you, but it's what the damn enterprise needs. Um, the other thing I think uh, is an important thing is to say, look, how, so you want to grow a business, but how big do you want it to be? Because it's, it's materials. You want a 10 million shilling business? You want 100 million shilling business? You want a billion dollar business? Also, the decisions that you make there uh, will also matter. So if you ask me very quickly what sort of my, sort of the sort of quick takeouts that I found were great guiding pillars in my life, I would say those are some of the most, uh, most foundational. So I have the last question. My name is Elijah, and Ken, I know you from before. I think we've met, we've met in our previous lives, or in my previous life. What were we doing? Did, did I say No, 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 we, we can't discuss did that. You, did, you <laughs> say did I fire you? Did you, did, you, did you leave me like these two guys? No, 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 no not at all. I, I was okay. actually almost a competitor. So, okay. But, but we'll talk about uh, that. So here's my question you for survive. you. Sorry? Then you didn't survive. Oh, <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't <laughs> survive in that environment. Okay. So here's the question. What's your biggest risk for Cellulant today? And the reason I ask that is 
from what you're saying, it sounds to me that you're betting on, on banks as a key partner. Yeah. But banks, like you said, don't change their minds often. And, and they have this habit of being disrupted, mm. you know, which is where M-Pesa came from and, and mobile payments. And you know, the next thing would be you know, Bitcoin, right? So because they have that habit of not changing their mind often, they're very prone to being disrupted. Mm. And, and as you said, the thing that drove them into your arms was exactly that, that yeah. they saw their pie shrinking and they're like, please, please come, tell me that thing you told me the last time. Can you still do it? So what is your biggest risk and you think you're betting on the right guy? Okay, so I think there is, okay, so th those are actually two questions. So there is, what is our big, biggest risk today? And um, the other one I interpret is, what's the rationale of uh, seemingly our business model? So maybe, let me start with uh, our biggest risk. So we have two risks. Uh, uh, which uh, keep me awake at night. One is internal, one is external. So our internal risk um, is fundamentally around people. Um, is that, uh, so where we are now is that we have, re our business model is relatively mature. Basically, means that the way that we make money and the way that the business generates value is clear. It's proven uh, and it's clear in the market. So you know that if I do that, then this is the outcome. If I do that, this is the outcome, this is the effort that's required. So that we know now. We are, we are not experimenting any longer. So there, the bis biggest barrier is internal. Is that, you know, how do we create a, a team that can be able to allow us to grow at the rate we want to grow? Um, um, today, 80% of my time is actually being spent on that problem alone. So one-on-ones, um, uh, -on -ones, looking at team structure, looking at processes, looking at talent, where is it gonna come from, what kind of talent, uh, how much of it can be grown internally, what is the culture that was, it's just internal talent. So today, that's the biggest barrier for growth. Um, externally, it's basically the fact that, okay, so we have moved from a competitive landscape where we competed with people that look like us. So we know how to compete with those that look like us. Uh, so a, we know how to compete with a, another company that's selling mobile banking to banks. We know how to compete with another company that's selling a payment platform to a merchant. The people that I worry about are the new entrants into our space. Uh, so, and, and they are coming from all directions. So they are typical startups, Bitcoin, whatever it is, and things like that coming into the payment space. But they also then, the sort of big boys also come into the payment space. And there is fragmented, it's the m -pesas of this world, the mobile money players there. Uh, playing, the, there are significant players in the payment space. Uh, Google is certainly interested. Apple is coming. Samsung will come. Huawei will come. Ericsson is interested in the space. Those are so the competitive landscape is completely uh, worrying. And then we are competing across markets where the regulatory framework is completely different. So that just competitiveness. Where how do we position ourselves? How are we going to compete? That is really the sort of uh, second big challenge that keeps me awake at night. In terms of our business model, um, look, we're a payments business. Um, payments business ultimately is, you know, I simplify it. So where does money come? Where does it go? Um, and um, that's just it. So when you look at it that way, then you realize that banks are enablers. You know, we don't, we don't, uh, we serve banks. They are fundamental enabler to our business, uh, but the way that we are constructing our business, we construct by looking at them as an enabler, not as an end. Um, so when you look at it that way, then this very um, uh, thing that you describe, which is the fact that then they are uh, generally slower than they should be, becomes an opportunity because then as an enabler, they realize that trend and then they want to work with somebody who kind of will figure out this payments landscape. So, so. Uh, so today, despite the fact that we don't actually have salespeople, well, banks do work to us because they realize the market has changed. So that's it. Um, of course, that does uh, mean that, you know, so when you have a critical enabler in the pillar and they don't move as quickly, that's a big challenge. So we are always con continuously wondering also, how do we make banks move as quickly as we should? Uh, and that um, is, uh, they were very slow at the beginning, but. Uh, now I think the, with the m -pesas of this world and uh, those kinds of things popping up, they certainly realize that they cannot, status quo cannot be maintained. So uh, today there's not a bank CEO. 
uh, across in any of the countries that, that <coughs> if, if you ask them, what's the number one priority, they'll tell you technology. And if you ask them, so what in technology, they'll tell you payments, mobile banking, whatever it is. They realize it. They also realize they can't move as quickly, so they are willing to partner a little bit more. And that dynamic is good for our business. One more. Sure, one Somebody more. Somebody with something to share? You said that uh, entrepreneurs in this time and age, they don't, from your thinking, they do not have as much resilience as you guys did back in the day. So yeah. maybe you could talk about that a little bit. And maybe, uh, maybe I was passing judgment. And uh, it's just that every time I'm sort of in a I have party, I meet young guys, they always say, so Ken, where's the money? <laughs> and I always, uh, my standard answer is always, do you have time? You can, let's sit and talk because the money is going to take quite a while <laughs> to come. So I think, yeah, it's a, so once you choose to build an enterprise, it's a long journey. I mean, I've been at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at it for how long now? 15 years. So I've been, cellular is about 10 years. I was at three mice for about five years. So I've been at it for 15 years. And, uh, and, and every, every time they write these things in the newspaper, uh, I, I always, you know, I always, uh, we are always joking with my wife, and my wife always asks me, so Ken, where is all this money? Where are you? And also my banker, you know, he will always say, so boss, where are you banking? Where are you hiding your money? So, so yeah, so the story is glossier than the reality. Uh, so money ta does take time. There is lots of paper value for sure. Uh, I enjoy the day-to-day -day grind. Uh, I've uh, since lost the myth that the problems will go away. There is zeros change. The number of zeros change, but the problems are more or less the same. You know, you still worry about payroll, you still worry about um, uh, sustainability, uh, you worry about service, you worry about risks to the business. Um, so the, those things are there. So, it, yeah, so those things just re, you know, require that you just keep going. So my summary around resilience is I always say that, well, you know what, um, the problems will always be there. Just make sure that when they walk, they, they will come and go. Just make sure you're still standing. Uh, so do whatever it takes to make sure that you're standing today, tomorrow, and that's a day-by-day -day thing. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and sooner or later they go. They always do. Uh, Ken, do you have a question for the audience, perhaps? Yeah, so what's it like uh, to start businesses uh, <laughs> these days? Uh, uh, have I quit too early by saying I will not start another business? <laughs> Elijah. It's, it's, it's so much easier. It's the same thing. No, no, it's so easy. It's much easier. So much easier. Okay. I mean, so I, I moved from startup world into, into Google. And my job is to make it easy for people to start businesses. Ah, so and uh, so and when you have companies like Google making it easy for people, it's certainly easier. Uh, I mean, last, no, seriously. You're just selling us a spiel. No. <laughs> you're just selling. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned that you had to go and, and, and buy servers. I mean, we can hook you up with $100,000 of Google Cloud credits like now. <laughs> And that will take you 12 months and drop your burn rate as a startup. Yeah. You know, if you think about customer acquisition, we could do things with AdWords. Like yeah. People have become more interested. No, seriously, though. So people have become more interested because they see the value, the long-term value of yeah. entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I think from that point of view, it's easier to start. It's still hard to succeed, but it's easier to start. Oh, yeah. Are you the Elijah that used to work in Uganda? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. True African, uh, right? Exactly. It's, so it's still very right. important it, principle. It, I track talent. It, it, it <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I know your reputation, but now wha what are you doing at Google? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about we'll talk have about this. I, to, this is why I said we have shouldn't. You we to, should. Have you come to cellular? It's so much more. Don't exciting. don't open this door. I mean, it's, Ken. I, it's so much exciting. Okay, so we hear that from a different perspective. Hi, I'm Victor. Uh, then I think it's really different from whatever he's saying. The thing is that uh, it depends on the type of business you're trying to start. 
Then secondly, the way you're saying uh, uh, that Google helps, or rather we have people like Omidyar, I have trying to help, we have different businesses that cannot access that, so it's really hard for them, you see. So it depends on, uh, I think, where you are and the kind of people you know. So that makes it easy for you to run your business. Okay. It's, uh, it's very good. Um, so it's a lot easier to set up businesses now. Um, in my case, maybe it might be because, you know, spent the last few years in the trough again. Um, but I find, you know, one, one phone call gets me the CEO I need to see. Two minutes later, you have the decision that needs to be made. Um, back when we were in the trough at Cellulant, I remember trying to, you know, because I was, I was, I was doing a lot of sales, and you're trying to get your foot in the door First of all, you don't have the airtime because it was ridiculously expensive. Um, so now you can afford to make 40-minute phone calls uh, off your cell phone sitting in the back of an Uber, um, you know, getting work done. Uh, so it, it becomes significantly easier. There's the spaces that help. The technology has become a lot easier. Um, the cost of doing business has become a lot easier. We are currently running on, I'm coming for those credits, by the way, but we're currently running on, on um, Asia, which is Microsoft services, and this is about $100,000 worth of uh, hosting for free because we are a startup business in Africa. So it is easier to get started. It's a lot easier to meet the people you need to. They're on Twitter, so you tweet them and ask them a question and the next thing you know, you're meeting the head of Deloitte Tax to help you hide the money from KRA that you need to hide so that you can pay salaries. So it's, 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 it's gotten a lot easier from the time when we were trying to set up some of those, um, you know, like the mobile money unit. So, so is that everybody's feeling yeah. that it's easier? I mean, so, so because it's then easier, what then has happened? Are the businesses then growing faster or are they, or are they, are they dying less? I mean, um, caring a lot more. You know, I mean, the proof of, I mean, easy is fine, but then what happens because it's easier? Do we get scale quicker? Do products get to market quicker? Do they get to success quicker? I mean, what happens? Because so then uh, if, if that's not happening, then I would say, well, easy doesn't translate into results. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people want to give you that card that says, I am CEO. Yeah. But no, you are like CEO of what? Okay. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's exactly what you say. You, you do something, you know, you build that app on an account. But it's not sustainable. It's not something that you can actually say, 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 for the post generation of work. Yeah. So there must be a whole lot of those. And then, and then, what you think is, um, it, it gets people a bit cocky because you can't. If they don't learn fast enough that you need, you know, to go far, you go together. If you want to go fast, you go alone. Unfortunately, you, like you said, you spot talent and you'll say, hey, I can see what you're trying to do, but probably the time is not now. Um, here's a home. You could incubate it. Because the thing is this, uh, the one thing I appreciate from uh, being at Three Mice and, um, and Cellulant is that you come in and you can see that someone knows you're probably not going to be there forever. There are those guys who come in, and you remember Kevin uh, at Three Mice, people you call Rock of Ages. You know, the guys will be in a company for 30 years. Now, those make good employees, but there are those guys who will come and will say, give me 110% of your three years, and I'll give you 100% of me. And probably when you leave, uh, and you're going to start that new thing, you never burn bridges, and you actually get now, you know, you're going to start something new. Here is X amount to start you, and, you know, let's, let's see where that goes. So, yes, it's easier to do stuff, but you're just seeing a lot of fueled lifestyles, and, you know, it hits a peak. The next big thing comes in. Guys are back knocking and saying, hey, um, is that gig still on, or could you send some business my way? And it, it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, as opposed to before when, you know, you go in, you know, and you're deciding you're moving out of home, uh, and you're in a startup, it's not, it's a do or die situation, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was, I always worry about that, that, yeah, that, is, that easy thing kind of creates a bubble that uh, um, doesn't quite give uh, entrepreneurs an opportunity to really anchor on the real values of business because that, those never changed because accessing finance is easier, setting servers is easier. You know, the foundational principles of a good business, as far as I'm concerned, really haven't changed. And 
And uh, yeah, so that's what I see when I, that theme of resilience, when I, I, I run into sort of some of the new entrepreneurs and whatever it is, uh, uh, yeah, and wor it worries me a lot. Yeah, Ken, one thing maybe I'd like to add for you is, and I'm glad Timo mentioned it, um, I, I, I can't comment about business getting easier to start business in terms of resources and access and all that, but the thing that has become easier is how quickly you can learn. So right now you learn faster because there are frameworks and there are methodologies you can use. So startups all over right now, we are advocating for uh, lean methodology. So you know from the very beginning, uh, know what your risks are, and from the, as early as possible, try and de-risk your business. And it helps that we have you to talk about it. So you know, th that sort of information helps us to learn quicker. Um, so instead of taking five years failing at, at, uh, at an enterprise, now it takes you uh, six months and you know this will not work, and you move on to the next thing. Well, I, I don't know about easier or hard, but I think one of the big problems we have at the moment is that we know too much. We know exactly the point where you start. We know this is the point you look for acquisition. We know what a success, successful startup looks like, and we don't know our own story. We know what other startups and what other businesses look like and what they're supposed to be like yeah. and so some of we don't get grounded into doing our thing we get grounded in looking for like following a path that a path of expectations this is how it will go this is what will happen next and so we we get lost along that path I'd, for me that's what i'd say from my ex small experience at the moment yeah. hi um hi Yeah. Um, so for me, I think that there's too much distraction nowadays with startups. I've uh, spent the last three years working with startups and uh, from the incubation space. So like training them, coaching them, and you find there's just too much distraction. I feel like uh, maybe during your time when there was only one option to survive or to survive, <laughs> then that was the only option. But nowadays there's so many options. You know, you have your, I don't know, you can always speak about how many... Uh, I don't know, followers you have on Twitter, you can tweet about stuff and people can keep you excited and you can feel like you're making progress. Um, I don't know, you can say that, you know, I've been featured in the newspapers, I'm on BBC, I'm on uh, The Economist, blah, blah, blah. So I feel like uh, there's so much distraction nowadays with companies that uh, people forget what the real value is. Um, and that's, uh, for me, is one is, uh, of the most critical things that has, uh, has happened, uh, at least of late, that I see with uh, startups. That you meet with guys, they're trying three, four, five different things at the same time. Um, and yeah, just getting them to focus on one thing just yeah. doesn't happen. Uh, yeah. So um. wha wha I mean, I'm, I'm curious. So, I mean, I, I, I came out, as Betty said, I com came out because I'm uh, kind of interested in what's going on in the market. Um, and I've, uh, I, I mean, I read a blog about uh, somebody who made a comment that there are all this hype about IT business in Kenya is actually hype. I mean, what's your sense out there? Is there uh, so beyond the sort of little name, little pivot wins and things like that, uh, uh, what's happening? Uh, are there more businesses which are now making it into the mid-stage out there? And which ones? Um, and I'm just generally ignorant, to be quite honest. I've just been very in, been, been in the kitchen. I feel like I've been in the kitchen for 10 years. I'll just say one thing, then I'll pass the mic. Uh, at least my view is that the guys who are making it, you don't hear about them. You just see them one day. They just show up on the door, and they've made it. Uh, my view is that the guys you read about in The Economist, and in BBC, and on CNN, and on The Nation, and The Business Daily, uh, most of them, the story is much more cooked than uh, it is. But there are people who are really doing stuff. Uh, it just depends on uh, which sector. Um, and you have to, like, th they won't be everywhere. You won't see them in, in, in every other startup event speaking about what they're doing. They'll be busy uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing in the office and just grinding, you know? Hi, Ken. Uh, hi, over here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I wanted to ask a question. Um, about the culture in your organization. What, what was it moving from, I guess, something like 10 guys to 230 guys? The, how did the culture change? How did you handle it as a CEO and all that? Yeah, so I, actually that change has been really chaotic. I, 
I, so for me as a CEO, you know, I, I, I don't think, I think that's one of the things that I didn't manage really well. Um, you, because so there's the aspiration of the culture in the business. There's aspiration of the foundation of values, what kind of business we wanted to build. Uh, but we didn't manage that process um, uh, f for many reasons, but we just didn't manage it. Um, so, so I'm actually, so my sort of focus now is actually to try and uh, fix it and organize it. So you do see, so if I was to describe the culture of the business today, um, I see some parts of the business are truly world class. I mean, I mean you, you, there are sometimes you walk into some brainstorm sessions, whatever, it is just world class thinking. You just, it's a beauty. Guys on top of their stuff, super committed, and whatever it is. And once in a while, I will run into some stuff and say, shit, this is Joakali. I mean, we've been at this for 10 years. Why is this happening? in this business? Why is it happening in a business I run? Um, so it's that sort of thing, and it's evolved. Uh, so because also at 2.30 people today, they are, they are, uh, the team is basically composed largely of people who are hired by people I never hired. So it kind of went off on their own tangent. Uh, the, we didn't organize and structure the messaging around what culture do we want, what people do we want, whatever it is. So now I'm going back to fix that. I'm completely obsessed about it, and it's one of the things I was saying is one of my first, is one of the things I consider my first internal risks, because I see if I don't fix it, it becomes increasingly difficult to fix it going forward, especially in a business that's actually growing. You know, so next year, if I try to do what we are doing now, people will be looking at me and they say, so what are you talking about? We're growing? Uh, business is generating cash. Why do you look like you're, why are you raising your temper, boss? <laughs> So we have to fix it. So didn't manage it well. Um, lost lots of good people. I mean, this Timo, Joel, these were really good guys, um, um, and a lot of others. Um, so yeah, so uh, that w that's been a tough. Uh, it's been a tough journey. It's been very incoherent. You know. So if you if you do a dipstick, you ask Joel what was your experience at Cellular, and you ask another guy in the next year, and you ask another guy, and another guy. It's a very checkered experience. So some guys have had a fantastic experience. Uh, they're still there. Some had a fantastic experience. They've left. That shouldn't have happened. Um, so that, I think, is really checkered. But, but today, I would say, if you know, going into the, um, uh, the battle of mobile commerce, I really like the army that I have. Uh, you know, they say you win the war with the army you have. The, the army I have, I really feel sorry for our competitors. Yeah, you're not a competitor anymore, no? Yeah, that's what happens to people. <laughs> so I have a good army. Okay. Thank you so much, Ken. And you can see, by the way, I'm shameless about talent. Very shameless. Elijah has no business working for me. <laughs> Elijah, you heard? <laughs> uh, so thank you so much. If you, if you listen closely, there's tons of key lessons in what Ken has said. So we have it all on video and we'll have that online for you um, to watch again and to share with your friends. Uh, Ken is still here if you'd like to talk to him personally. Uh, please stay around, have some food and drinks. Uh, it's really great to have you here, meet people. That there are a lot of interesting people in the room, uh, make contacts. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our sponsors who make Startup Grand possible. I'd like to say a big thank you to the rest of my team some of them who are sitting out there uh, wouldn't be here without their input. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, and yeah, stay and have a good time. Thank you for coming. <laughs>